Thank you very much. Within the field of New Testament and early Christian writings, there is a consensus that Christian origins, in quotation mark, temporally means the first century of the common era. Every college introductory textbook in the New Testament or early Christianity assumes this. I note as an example the most widely used introductory textbook, Bart Ehrman's The New Testament, a historical introduction to early Christian writings. Despite the explicit announcement that the introduction will be historical, he assumes a first century origin of Christianity, even though it can be argued that no first century text that was eventually included in the Christian canon was written by authors who identified themselves as Christian. <coughs> even more noteworthy, and perhaps a little ironic, is the splendid work of Burton Mack, who has devoted much of his later career to the effort of redescribing Christian origins. To show that the Gospel of Mark, indeed the entire New Testament, represents a myth of origin rather than a history of the beginnings of Christianity. The Christian myth was constructed in the first century by Paul and the writers of the Gospel of Mark and the writer of Luke and Acts, Max, Mac thinks. What follows after this century is the legacy of the original first century myth. In this sense, and only in the sense of temporally placing Christian origins in the first century, Mack's redescription turns out to be a historiographical reinscription. But let the exceptional work of Urban and, and Mack's origin legacy model stand as a signal uh, example of how difficult it is to reimagine the first century outside the framework of Christianity's own myth of origin. That, of course, is mythically, and it turns out, historically focused at the beginning, to quote Mark 1.1. The dominant default in the field of the formation and history of emergent Christianity is the assumption of the mystique of first, Christ, uh, first century origins. Christianity's own myth of origins de facto has become the universal scholarly history of Christian beginnings. Fiction has indeed become history in much modern scholarship, just as it was in antiquity, as Glenn Bowersock has shown us so well. In what follows, I look at just one literary example, the Gospel of Mark, to see if it can bear the burden of the Christian myth of origin. Um, first, on accounting for the literary move from heterogeneous archival Jesus stuff to a bios, a history-like, biography-like, uh, excuse me, narrative. Burton Mack, in A Myth of Innocence, has satisfied me on how Mark did it. That is, Mack has outlined convincingly both a narrative and a social-cultural logic that accounts for Mark's biography-like narrative. Arnaldo Momigliano has given the best possible general surmise that permits near satisfaction on why Jesus' adherents also produced bios exemplars in the first century and beyond. Thus, Momigliano. Biography gained prestige in the imperial age for contradictory reasons. Biography was the natural form of telling the story of a Caesar. On the other hand, biography was a vehicle for unorthodox political and philosophical ideas. The written, the, or excuse me, the writers of biography created a meaningful relationship between the living and the dead, so argues Omegliano, and this as a way of drawing genetic leakages between a myth, that is an arche, uh, mythic origins in Marx's sense, and whatever social formation is imagined as normatively desirable. Now, Marx's option for the biography genre for achieving this kind of coupling is novel on the landscape of the production of Jesus literature, but categorically there is nothing especially novel or counterintuitive in choosing this genre. The motivational force behind Marx partially can be uncovered in the narrative itself. Um, I'm attracted to a crisis scenario elaborated in Max A Myth of Innocence as the most compelling motive set for the ultimately apocalyptic logic of Mark. Uh, 
so sharply focused as it is on the devastation of Jerusalem and the temple and the fallouts caused by the Jewish war. Surely for the writer of Mark, we must reckon that there was a set of issues that had enormous stakes for him. Issues that can hardly be construed as benign, mundane quibbles over this or that preference in an ethnically and religiously and socially heterogeneous locale, such as the Galilee or the Levant. The heat of the adversarial rhetoric and the shrill tone of Mark's justification of the truth of his story suggests otherwise. Indeed, I prefer to suggest as my stipulation the view argued by Bill Arnell, namely that Mark is a narrative, quote, reflection on exile and identity. Uh, he notes that despite enormous labors over more than a century, the Gospel of Mark, quote, strenuously resists our procedure of positing a usually Christian community and making inferences about the author's agenda in terms of interaction with that community. End of quote. So he abandons the explanatory assist of a market community whose social interests and social formational agenda are somehow encoded in the gospel come myth, come social charter. Rather, he takes from Burton Mack the point that Mark is the work of a scholar and suggests that the what is he up to question posed by Mark's narrative might be answered more satisfactorily if we focus, and I'm quoting here, him here now, if we focus on the intellectual problem solved by Mark rather than the role of Mark in a distinct Christian group whose essential characteristics can be recovered by us. The occasion for Mark's reflection our now suggests on the basis of a persistent and multifaceted preoccupation uh, in Mark's narrative is, quote, the Jewish war and the fallout subsequent to the war. The gospel is Mark's answer, essentially, in narrative form to the problems, actual problems, social problems, but also problems for thought that were caused by the Jewish war. Bill then offers the tentative suggestion based on an oft-overlooked but telling uh, details in Mark that an answer to the question of what kind of real-world historical author we might, to what kind of real-world historical author we might attribute the gospel, um, we might think of someone um, who is exiled or even doubly exiled once by virtue of, some, uh, of a somehow tainted Jewish identity, thus a stranger in the Judean homeland, secondly, from a destroyed templeless homeland from which he or she is now finally displaced and forced to make a home and identity in a strange land where homeland and temple cannot um, function even as nostalgic treasures. What I like about this argument is that it correlates the form and content of Mark's narrative with an authorial agenda and a highly plausible historical situational incongruity that appears to be of a crisis proportion to the author. And an equally plausible person whom one can envision as thinking about the, about thinking, uh, as thinking about the situation and about the way that are now proposed. All this without having to postulate, as uh, contrary to what Mark allows us to do, a discrete community that is urgently engaged in its own formation with reference to a social charter encoded in the Je Jesus biography. Mark appears to be a local story with a local agenda for its author. It does not strike me as a myth of origins for a community but rather a reflection by an author on the fly on matters of incongruity and urgent concerns associated with the Jewish war and its aftermath. I move on to a second remark that is also part of the setup for the central point of this paper. I would like you now to shift from the first century to the second century, and uh, I'd like you uh, to permit me to suggest that N.T. Mark, as I will call canonical Mark, is in a complex way that is only opaquely discernible a product of the second century. When it was pressed into now rather explicitly Christian duties that it did not carry at the point of its original composition. 
These duties were largely of a political sort that are either ignorant of or more likely egregiously dismissive of the authorial agenda of whoever created the initial Markan narrative. That Mark had a literary history both, both prior to N.T. Mark, that is Dean S. Lee Holland or UBS text, and after N.T. Mark is well known. Even if the precise stages of this history and N.T. Mark's placement in this history is rather unclear and hence contested. What matters to me is that this history cannot be understood as a text that is a changing, growing, um, shrinking or expanding in the hands of a single school or community over time, adapting or altering its own myth of origins to suit changing sociological realities within the group. Analogous, uh, say, to the composition history of Q, a product of, of staged composition and likely exegetical tinkering by a discrete community or Jesus school over time. And I could add other analogies, perhaps the Gospel of Thomas over um, the Johannine Corpus. No, rather than seeing the, the uh, literary history and reception history of Mark as an un organic unfolding of a trajectory, to use a precious term in our field, I say that sarcastically. <laughs> Uh, and possibly in coordination with the social history of a particular Christian group, rather than seeing it as that, I see it as a history of confiscation and assimilation. <coughs> and I offer several familiar examples to support this generalization. I don't need to do a lot on them because they're so familiar to most <coughs> people. The first is that the writers of Matthew and Luke purloined Mark's general literary structure as well as most of the discrete parts of the narrative thus paying respect to Marx's literary genius, but erasing or refracting Marx's argument about the import of Jesus from Marx's agenda. In short, Matthew and Luke confiscated Marx's literary form and structure and erased by overwriting his thought. Uh, think, for example, of the erasure of Marx's aggressive assertion that I alone am he, Jesus. Christ in 13.6, over against which all other such claims are condemned as plane, as error. An assertion taken up by Matthew and Mark, or Luke to be sure, but now presumably turning Mark's accusation against him and treating his gospel as an error that needs to be uh, corrected. That's the first. Uh, the second the critically reconstructed editio princeps of the ending of Mark's Gospel as presented in the Greek text of the Nestle Island editions is now is not how canonical Mark ends, as every first year New Testament student knows. Mark 16, 9-20 is a secondary edition by an unknown author who made use of the other Gospels in order to make his addition to Mark resemble documents that had attained at least some level of popularity in Christian communities. A case can be made that the beginning of N.T. Mark, that is Mark 1, 1 to 3, also has been subject to editorial tampering. I'm referring here to what to me is an important article by J.K. Elliott, Mark 1, 1 to 3, a later edition to the Gospels, with a question mark. It certainly was prefaced later by the anti-Marcionite prologue uh, although that, I'm not going to make a big deal of it because the dating of it is so <laughs> uncertain. But if so, both ending and beginning, that is the two most crucial reading bias storage sites in any literary work, show the work of secondary scribal authorial activity. I now raise a third example that some might well see as a red flag or a stinky fish. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about Clement of Alexandria's fragment of a letter to Theodore and its reference to a citation from the infamous secret gospel uh, circulating in Alexandria. Uh, the authenticity of this letter is heatedly disputed for a variety of reasons, many of which uh, need not concern us here. Someone named Mark as the eponymous founder of a Christian association in Egypt and the use of some version of the gospel of Mark there are often 
enough we marked in the patristic sources. And since I can't think of any tendentious motive for making up especially the latter item, its historical veracity is likely in the range of the probable. If Clement's letter to Theodore is genuine, I see two things of interest in Clement's rebuke of the corporation's unspeakable teachings, which apparently included, quote, things they keep saying about the divinely inspired gospel according to Mark, and his remarks on the making of Mark's gospel, a making that had a, a three-stage uh, process. The first edition in Rome consisted of an account of the Lord's doings for increasing the faith of those who were being instructed. The second, taking place in Alexandria, aimed at enabling, quote, progress towards knowledge and was, quote, more spiritual gospel, a more spiritual gospel for the use of those who were being perfected. The third stage, also in Alexandria, consisted of additions of certain sayings of which he, that is Mark, knew the interpretation of as a mystagogue. And it would lead hearers into the innermost sanctuary of that truth hidden by seven tales. Now, given the historical uncertainty about the value of Clement's letter, firmer conclusions are inappropriate but a conjecture of reasonable probability might not be. This is that N.T. Mark is a second century confiscation by redaction of some Alexandrian's Gospel of Mark, a confiscation accomplished by partially excising or editorially muting, however sloppily, uh, Alexandrian Mark's mysterian emphasis, its mystery accent. By giving it now a new introduction, that is 1, 1 to 3, and a proper canonical ending. I say partially and sloppily because the Mysterion accent remains a strongly evident feature in New Testament Mark, in the so called secrecy motif first isolated by William Freire in 1901, and most remarkably also in Mark's uh, parable uh, theory where the mystery of the kingdom of God is given only, given only to the insiders, and the outsiders are going to hear everything as a parable, strange use of the term parable. As it is in New Testament Mark, Jesus hums vestiges of a biphonic too. He is both purveyor of secret knowledge in N.T. Mark and an apocalyptic prophet of judgment, a combination that is, of course, not unique to Mark. And so I continue to ask for, uh, for consideration that N.T. Mark is a second century confiscation by redaction of some Alexandrian's version of Mark. The Markan story, I suggest, appears to have been a variable cultural operator, ending up as a kind of hapless child in second century inter-Christian inter -Christian custody battles. In its wandering from, from the first century to the latter part of the second century, Mark evidently picked up and dropped different, differentiable diacriticals, all important accents. It is not too difficult to imagine, for instance, that the biphonics in Mark, that is the mystery and apocalyptic um, tunes, could be exploited in some Alexandrian Christians' mystery context, perhaps even enhanced by redactional activity so as to render the Markan narrative as a clearer source and elaboration of the mysterion of the kingdom of God. Whether this mysterion is the motive and subject for intellectual research or the focus of uh, initiation rituals or possibly uh, both. Let me now move toward the core issue of the Markan example by reconsidering the two best attested data items about Mark in the second century. Both are well known and often remarked in scholarship. Together, however, they pose a most interesting incongruity that begs for some thought. And I now uh, I to refer you to a splendid book by uh, my former student, Michael Koch, The Gospel on the Margins, who's meditated 
at much greater length and detail about these things. The first is the near absence of evidence for use of Mark as a text of intrinsic interest for exegetical, apologetic, or liturgical purposes by the Christian literati in the second and early Christian, third centuries, and beyond for that matter. In marked contrast to their extensive use of Matthew, Luke, and John, there is not a single trace of evidence that there ever was anything like a Markan school or textual community um, that is a micro-society organized around a Markan script of some sort, in which Mark enjoyed place, much less pride of place. The only evidence, you know, we, we, we have, and it's, 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 uh, <coughs> Uh, is the presence of an Alexandrian community that used Mark as a mystery document. Otherwise, there is no, no evidence. In, in lieu of a long recitation of a survey of the sources here, I piggyback on the work of Brenda <coughs> Dean Shilkin on the reception history of the Gospel of Mark. And I string together uh, here just her bottom line statements on what she calls Mark's absent presence in the early Christian documentary record. She says, the gospel was present in the canon, but essentially absent from attention. It was without intrinsic merit. The references or allusions to the gospel of Mark in citations and lectionary cycles in the patristic period point conclusively to the absence of Mark as a major text in the early church. The actual Count of the citations shows that if there is a stepchild in the canon, Mark is the one about whom the fathers spoke most infrequently. All in all, Augustine's offhand dismissal of Mark as a breviator in the context of proposing his two-source theory of gospel relationships reflects the judgment about Mark in the centuries preceding Augustine. He says, separately, he has little to record. Whatever ideational or ideological, social, or political work the Gospels were made to perform in post-first century Christian formation, Mark's narrative, and much more so his myth, were a silent, sideline presence, with the possible Alexandrian exception uh, I mentioned uh, a moment ago. So the question then arises, why is Mark in the canon at all? The second datum concerning Mark in the second century and the patristic period in general provides the answer. And the answer has to do with how Mark became a prestige good without any intrinsic value. This is what I want to make of the patristic citation or tradition of insisting that what the author of Mark wrote derived from Peter. I am referring to the Mark as the interpreter of Peter postulate, first claimed by Papias in the middle of the third of the second century, then repeated with some variation in detail by Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, and on and on into the third and fourth and fifth centuries, becoming a fact by means of repeated recitation until the onset of modern biblical criticism. In terms of historical authenticity, the claim that Mark was the ghostwriter of what really is Peter's gospel is undoubtedly bogus, but that is quite beside the point of my interest. What is of interest is that this claim is made, then repeated so often that it seems to reach the status of taken for granted and undisputed fact. Why? <coughs> well, based on the scholarly commentary record, I'm now referring to the modern scholarly commentary record, one recurring answer is that the argumentative value of the Mark-Peter connection is, quote, to uphold the integrity and worth of Mark. This is in Hugh Anderson's words. Integrity and worth, however, are put under serious doubt by the striking lack of interest by anyone in actually reading Mark. A lack, moreover, that is not alleviated by what appears to be such certain knowledge that Mark's text really is Peter's gospel. Hence, I would think that the Petrine connection as a credo had little to do with the integrity and worth of Mark, at least not with reference to its intrinsic value. It is also difficult to explain Petrine authorship of Mark by supposing that the status ascendancy of Peter in the second century and beyond should be appropriately recognized by a gospel, which, though he didn't actually write one, nonetheless would be his anagraphe or record 
I'm using Clement of Alexandria's term here. This would require us to believe that Peter was responsible for a record that on the evidence from Mark's narrative is most anti-Petrine, matched only by the anti-Petrinism in Paul and perhaps in John 1 to 20. It is in this connection that I find most amusing a tiny bit of slippage in the credulity of one of Clement's rehearsals of Peter is Mark, uh, is Mark is Peter's interpreter. He intimates that Mark's record on a graffiti might have been a case of an unauthorized memoir. I paraphrase what Clement said to accent the amusement, uh, to accent the amusement factor. This is what uh, uh, Clement says. When Peter learned of this, and he's referring to Mark's project of writing out a euangelium that Peter had been preaching in Rome, when Peter learned of this, he said, I won't stop him, but I sure as hell wouldn't give him any encouragement either. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the incongruity. Mark, a prestigious narrative by virtue of its placement in the emerging canon. Mark, apparently without intrinsic value in the very canon that bestows prestige on it, hence is really absent, even though present. Uh, Mark is presented as Peter's anagraphe, but without any consequence for, consequence for Mark's influence. And Mark presented as Peter's anagraphe, despite the fact that Mark's story features Peter as a rather dense, misunderstanding figure. So a different tack is called for. It is of interest to me to see, as others are seeing as well, an appreciative, even rehabilitating reconsideration of the once heretical argument made by F.C. Bauer long ago that Paul and his, his theology of Christ crucified and his view that Torah was passé in the new Christos era represented not a widespread, much less central view among the earliest Christian groups, but as interesting to observe as Joel Marcus and others have pointed out a remarkable return to the question of the relation between Mark and Paul, a question that had been considered to have been answered uh, in the 19th century. My supposition is that a re-examination of the question would allow us to stake an answer somewhere between the extreme views of uh, Martin Vanna and uh, uh, Gustav Volkmann. Uh, one thinking that, that uh, Mark's gospel is an allegory in which Jesus is really Paul, and the other uh, refuting that. That is, I'm suggesting that Mark can be reconstrued not as a Petrine, but as a Pauline anagraphe. In fact, Joel Marcus has, done, has already gone a long way in that direction, uh, though he does not use the term anagraphe. I have here a long citation. Uh, from uh, Joel Marcus, where he correlates um, the uh, passages from Paul and passages from Mark to note their correspondence. And it is a long list indeed. Uh, I'm just going to say that I think Marcus is generally right. And if so, why not try another move and seriously consider the possibility that Mark should be placed on the same side of what Joseph Tyson in his consequential book on Marcion and Luke Acts, calls the defining struggle over marking a Christian center in the second century. Uh, this same side I'm referring to is the side of Marcion and his Paul, something that was apparently uh, presumed, if not known, late in the second century. And again, I point to the anti-Marcionite stuff uh, especially the prologue to Mark. Mark's originary local, pro uh, local problems in all their poignancy and his urgent response to them were transposed into, confiscated for a struggle over defining later Christian trends. Originary Mark was a local story and it seems to have survived not, not because of its merits as a story, nor because it was a Christian myth of origin, and a social chart of the first century Jesus community, Mark rather serves in the second century, a structure, uh, second century and beyond, a structural function that is not tied to the merits of the narrative itself. One might think of it analogous to the structural completion of the College of the Twelve by the enrollment of Matthias in the college uh, to replace Judas. 
And so I end with some comments of a mythological and conceptual kind on critical historiography and origins. Of course, these following comments have in view Christian origins, but analogies abound for the study of origins in other religions, nation states, or the political, interactional, and situational processes of what Rogers Brubaker's called group making. <coughs> for all of these entities do things, often with remarkable force to establish categories or usurp available myths, narratives, or texts in order to pose a past that is able to authorize interests in the present. The notion of a market community engaged in a myth-making project as rationalization for its diagnosis of an incongruous social situation and its remedial experiments in social formation is inadequate to account for the prestige or status value of, gospel, of the Gospel of Mark as a second century artifact. The eventual production of canonical Mark and its emplacement in the canon was a precipitate of intra-Christian and Turnicene squabbles over centers and margins at a time after the first century, when, echoing Marshall Salons and Bruce Lincoln, actors with distinct myths of origin relate their actions to each other with sentiments of affinity and sentiments of hostility. Looking at N.T. Mark as a bone in the mid to late second century Christian dogfight over alpha dog status does not require us to abandon N.T. Mark as an interesting though problematic datum for er originary emergent Jesus adherents. But looking at it as a second century artifact does well up a different uh, set of descriptive requirements and conceptual challenges for a scholarly redescription of the conventional myth of Christian origins. We have perhaps overstressed our expectation of Mark as a key witness for quote-unquote Christian myth-making in the first century. The reasons are partly due to Mark's eventual achievement of first gospel status in post-enlightenment gospel criticism, and partly due to the displacement of its historical evidentiary value by means of the invention of the Petrine connection and the canonizing process. Mark is in motion across time, place, and social setting, and the shifting contingent and local historical realities through which the gospel passed are not best thought of in terms of continuities and trajectories, which obscure precisely those contingencies of greatest interest to us about Mark's historical work, or work in history. New Testament Mark is but a stop in this story's hither, <coughs> whither, and yawn, a stop that, is effectively, that effectively centers Mark where, now standing shoulder to shoulder with Paul and John, for example, he is largely muzzled concerning whatever originary problem he tried to think about and where he repudiates the interests of his most avid readers, the Alexandrians, in exchange for acting as a ceremonial guard of the Christian palace that was under construction in the face of threatening Christian outposts, that is, at least in the minds of the palace constructors. Perhaps counterintuitively, consider a historical, historiographical stance that may help us to conceive of the second century preceding the first. This is not to say uh, I hasten to add that nothing happened in the first century. Um, but it is to say that whatever happened in the first century is massively mediated to us by what happened in the second century and later, for that matter. In that sense, the first Christian century is the creation in the second century and beyond. In the process of creating myths of the past, linkages, trajectories, successions, traditions go not forward in time, but backwards. They are categories made for, indeed made in, a retrospective mode that is in the mood for first times. This holds true not only for Christian origins, but for all quests for origins of religion, or a religion, or any other valued institution such as a nation state, or a religion, or an ethnicity, and so forth. These need to be perennially established in the beginning that is retroactively projected into the past, as only once the institution exists. I would suggest that these terms, to which one might add others, especially canon, or canon making and legacy making, might become subject to what Jonathan Smith calls the rectification of categories. Thinking of the text of the author of Mark as a pawn in tactics and strategies not of his own making, and far removed from his originary interest in laments, in 
as an example by means of which to think about these matters makes a great deal of sense to me. A brief conclusion. As Bruce, as Bruce Lincoln finally states it, all institutions, like all groups, tell stories about their beginnings. Such tales are often repeated, finely wrought, and usually much beloved. It's hardly can be said of the Gospel of Mark. Origin, especially as thought of in much past and contemporary thought and practice in the critical study of religion, is an extraordinarily overloaded term. Although origin can carry diverse meanings in the study of religion, it is a privileged, mythic, theological category. As Tomoko Mazazawa has shown in her search of dream time, the so-called fathers of the modern academic study of religion, say for example, David, David Hume, and Max Mueller, and Fraser, and Hegel, and Sigmund Freud, and many others. They were in one way or another engaged in a quest for the origin of religion, where origin is the plenum, the site of the true explanation of the beginning and development of religiosity in human society. It follows that when scholars write the history of a particular religion, that origin in the sense of absolute beginning is a prominent and perhaps troublesome point of preoccupation, even devotion, in the academy. And since origin tends to mean in the beginning, the possibility that origins are retrospective constructions has immense historiographical implications for the history of religions, Christianity, Included. Thank you.